Good morning. I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to discuss the potter's wheel from so many points of view. It is a pleasure to present recent data from Mesopotamia. Traditionally, it is considered as the spread of the potter's wheel in Mesopotamia as occurred in the late 4th millennium BC. This conviction was the coherent result of a linear and teleological vision of history. As an extra somatic strategy of adaptation, a technique was assumed to respond to socioeconomic goals to overcome limits imposed by the environment. Therefore, it was rational to associate the diffusion of a new disruptive technology with the crucial moment in the evolution of the Mesopotamian societies. Thus, the potter's wheel was associated with another innovation emerging in the late 4 millennium southern Mesopotamia, namely urbanization. The first extensive agglomerations were considered as receptacles, gathering people supposedly sharing the same ceramic needs to which specialized craftsmen had to respond in a new standardized way, with large-scale production of an iconic container, bevel dream bolts. However, recent studies on the potter's wheel have dismissed environmental economic determinism and knowledge about 4 millennium Mesopotamia has advanced considerably. Southern Mesopotamia, occupied by the cultural entity called Uruk from the eponymous site, is no longer essentialized as the only cradle of social complexity. Much attention has been paid to the independent but equally ancient path to complexity developed by the proto-urban formations of northern Mesopotamia. Once abandoned stereotypes about urbanization and techniques, such as the assumption that bevel dream bowls were wheel thrown, and they are not. One fact remains true. In Mesopotamia, the potter's wheel appears in the early 4 millennium BC, in a context of intense north-south interactions between northern late Calcolithic polities and southern Uruk proto-cities, which established enclaves, villages, and lastly, new Uruk cities in the north. The appearance of the wheel in the early 4 millennium northern Mesopotamia has recently been studied and compared with evidence from the 5th millennium Levant. So, concerning the Uruk sphere, it is essential to establish chronology and modalities of the emergence of this new technique. It is also crucial to understand whether the wheel appears in the south because of a borrowing as a local invention spreading to the north or rather as an independent innovation with specific features. Significant data to answer these questions are offered by two case studies based on French excavations providing particularly re reliable information from well-stratified context covering the entire duration of the Uruk phenomenon. Telferes al Sharki is a rural site in northern Syria, and the sites of Gerbikala and Logardan are located in the Zagros Piedmont, in the Karadag area in the Iraqi Kurdistan. The paces of the Uruk South Mesopotamian presence in these two regions are not identical, but together the sequences of Telferes and the Karadag sites cover the whole time span of the cultural contact between North Mesopotamian societies and Southern Uruk communities during the 4th millennium BC. The Uruk presence in the Karadag area is extremely early, about three centuries older than the Telferes and in the Syrian steppes. From the beginning, it was a massive presence, with an acropolis, stone ramps, monumental buildings, large production areas, and later with the foundation of an autonomous Uruk village at Girdikala, north. At Alferes and in the whole western Mesopotamian sector, relations between indigenous people and Uruk immigrants developed gradually and lasted longer. But in both cases, relations between indigenous and foreign inhabitants were characterized by deep social integration. Since the early 4 millennium BC, both the Uruk and the northern assemblages are characterized by a small quantity of pottery produced by using the archaea. In the third phase, phase A, each assemblage presents only one bowl produced by the new technique. Then, in phases B and C, shapes become three, two bowls and a small jar within each assemblage. 
Finally, in phase D, the shapes produced by using the RKE remain three, but in both cases, the most ancient types are replaced by other bowls. Over the centuries, one can observe a slight increase in quantity of these containers, but they remain rare. Despite morphological differences between North and South Mesopotamian repertoires, a deep technical parallelism is evident. All samples have dense mineral fabrics, thin walls, dimensions unsuitable for rations or daily circumstances, and slightly internal profiles adequate to hold uh, maybe a liquid content. The two types of jars have small dimensions suitable for highly praised substances. They are equipped with devices to facilitate the slow pouring of a precious liquid and have close shapes, easy to cup. Compared to beveled ring bowls, wheel-fashioned ceramics have completely opposite features. Beveled ring bowls are ubiquitous, rough, functionally flexible, serially produced and often have different sizes, while the RKE fashion shapes are rare, manufactured with extreme care, extraordinarily standardized and intended for very specific uses. They all are wheel-coiled, namely produced by using the RKE for thinning, shaping and finishing rough out previously assembled by coiling. In the whole northern Mesopotamia, the wheel coiling was implemented by assembling a rough out made of rounded coils of about 2 cm thick, with oblique orientation of the junctions towards the interior side of vessels then shaped and finished on slow wheel. Throughout the Uruk sphere, the rough out was prepared by overlapping flattened 3.5 cm thick coils with alternating oblique orientation of the junctions toward the interior and exterior side of the containers that were shaped by the RKE on a wheel. North and South Mesopotamian craftspeople shared a solid common technical basis. The evolution of the wheel coiling takes place at the same pace for both North Mesopotamian and Uruk potters. This is not accidental. Social and production contexts were entirely similar. In this respect, the special distribution of the Uruk wheel coil containers is significant of their exceptional value. In the Karadag, Uruk wheel coil pottery comes from two specific production and use contexts, multiple kilns and monumental buildings. Multiple composite kilns are not simply vertical draft structures, which are well attested in Mesopotamia since the 6th millennium BC. Multiple kilns consist in several structures connected by internal and external ventilation pipes. Their masonries were embedded in each other, so they were not just associated kilns, but rather conceived and built as a single structure of sophisticated technology. All the other wheel-coiled Uruk vessels come from the main hall of different monumental buildings, large complexes occupying spatial locations with pottery pipes for the evacuation of rainwater, well-plastered rooms with one meter thick stone walls and facades decorated by large regular mud brick buttresses. In the later phase, in late Uruk phase D, wheel-coiled ceramics come from Telferes reaches burials. Likewise, at Uruk, the eponymous site in southern Mesopotamia, all the shapes, usually wheel coiled, come from the sounding conducted under the sacred area of the Anna district. So the exceptional value of Uruk wheel coiled pottery is confirmed by its concentration in buildings depending on social elites and in structures associated with spatial technologies. Furthermore, wheel-coiled Uruk containers are extremely standardized, as indicated by the coefficient of variation of the rim diameters. According to the so-called standardization hypothesis, low coefficients of variation indicate a high level of control of motor skills attained only through a high rate of production. Low coefficients of variation combined with quite small productions, Uruk wheel-coiled ceramics are rare, suggests that within your communities, a limited number of highly specialized potters were in charge of wheel-coiled production. 
Actually, all these highlights are not exclusive of the Uruk wheel coiled containers. Recently, they have been also observed for the appearance of the wheel coiling technique in northern Mesopotamia and the Levant. Wheel coiled pottery was rare, small sized, initially limited to bowls, with a slow and progressive extension to other functional categories. It was intended for special occasion, concentrated in spaces connected to elites, extremely standardized due to the work of few specialists in charge of these highly valuable ceramics. So, since the Uruk wheel coiling emerges in the early 4th millennium, at the same time as the North Mesopotamian wheel coiling, one could speculate that its appearance was the result of a borrowing occurred in the framework of intense North-South relationships. Nevertheless, Uruk potters use the wheel in a very specific way. The focus here is not on the North and South Mesopotamian methods of assembling the rough out. These are differences related to the coiling technique. The central question is how the wheel was used. It is difficult to answer because the RKE has such a deep effect on the clay mass that it tends to homogenize all the traces. However, features stressed here can be identified through an autoptic and microscopic analysis without requiring too much investment in terms of laboratory technologies and instruments. Uruk wheel coiled shirts have never bulges or cracks on the surfaces. Their appearance is more homogeneous and devoid of flaws. Streaks on the surfaces are uniform, much thinner than those observable on North Mesopotamian productions. But the smooth, uniform appearance of the surfaces is interrupted at regular intervals by small grooves slightly deeper and wider than the streaks. On a microscopic level, although all the North and South Mesopotamian samples are made from dense, fine, low porous mineral pastes, Euro containers have less voids than North Mesopotamian ones. Moreover, once divided the sections, of the shares into three portions, an internal and external band and a central core, the few voids are essentially concentrated in the central part. This seems to suggest that the Uruk vessels were shaped on the wheel not by hand, but with the help of a tool, probably a hard matter lissoir or smoothing instrument, which gave the surfaces their homogeneous appearance regularly marked by little grooves corresponding to the points of contact between the edges of the tool and the wall of the vessel. The extremely reduced porosity concentrated in the core of the perpendicular section is the, quite, is the result of forces having affected not only the surfaces, but also the inner part of the walls. The clay has undergone more radical transformations than the North Mesopotamian specimens. In order to translate these uh, observations into a reliable reconstruction of how the wheel was used, an experimental protocol has been implemented. Between 2016 and 19, three potters, all experts in the wheel coiling technique but belonging to different traditions and regions, were asked to produce replicas of small bowls according to the methods typical of the North Mesopotamian and Uruk traditions. They used dense mineral tempered paste with a small presence of limestone, as in all ancient Mesopotamian fabrics. Then archaeological specimens and experimental replicas were compared both in terms of macro traces and thin sections, coming from the lower part of ancient and experimental vessels. In fact, as Ricartier has recently demonstrated, especially for the wheel throwing technique, in the lower part of a vessel, the clay mass undergoes a significantly greater deformation. Working with a shipping tool, a wooden platelet or a similar bone instrument, introduces new factors. Potter's gestures, postures and hands position change. The use of an instrument radically alters the sensorial perception of the pressures applied on the container. Actually, these professional issues are approached from the specific point of view of the potter's work by treatises 
dating back to the Italian Renaissance. Neither ancient text nor the potters who participated in the experimental sessions considered these tools to be advantageous or disadvantageous, but simply inherent to different ways of performing the shaping. The alteration of the immediacy of the touch sensations can result in little stronger contacts between the platelet and the wall of the vessel than those between the hand and the wall itself. However, these applications of greater force are of very short duration, with uncontrolled, more intense contacts immediately leading to pressure relief and without any deeper action on the matter. So, the use of an instrument during the shaping makes it possible to accur accurately reproduce the smooth surfaces and small grooves left by the edges of, of the platelets. But this, not, this, this does not allow to justify the peculiar configuration of the porosity observed on York samples. The deeper action on the clay is not the result of greater pressure by means of an instrument, but rather the effect of greater RKE. During the experimental sessions, what made it possible to obtain stretched and concentrated pores in the core of the walls was a substantial increase in the speed of rotation. Obviously, small pores, as those produced in the 4 millennium BC, require quite high speeds reached in a short time, and speeds vary greatly in the making of any single type of vessel. However, on the basis of our experimental trials, we called containers of North Mesopotamian traditions were made of an average speed around 60 RPM, 50-60 RPM, which is a very usual speed for an expert potter. On the other hand, Europe will call it containers seem to have been produced at a much higher speed of rotation, around 100 RPM which is almost enough to will throw pots. This does not mean that Uruk craftspeople were almost able to will throw vessels because certain potential inherent in a device does not imply that this device is being used to its full potential. But different speeds have deep implications. Potters working on a slow wheel cannot throw pots with both hands and spin the wheel at the same time they exploit the momentum created in bursts, often the help of an assistant is necessary. The only other possible option is represented by a different kind of rotary device as the double or quick kick wheel, able to reach very high speeds keeping the hands free. At the moment, in the absence of archaeological evidence, it is impossible to know what kind of wheels was used by Uruk potters. But they worked with a hard tool, implying a specific sensation to learn and control in order to apply appropriate pressures on the clay mass. They worked with hands even busier than North Mesopotamian craftspeople at higher speeds, implying a greater need to spin the wheel. Probably they were helped by an assistant or used a wheel typologically and technically different from that adopted by North Mesopotamian craftspeople. So, this suggests that the Yurk wheel calling technique was a tradition quite distinct from the North Mesopotamian one, and was not the result of a technical borrowing. And thank you very much for your attention.